Hey, good afternoon, Grace. Welcome here. My name is Jeff, one of the leaders here at Grace Evergreen. So glad you're here. If this is your first time joining us, or maybe you've been with us since the very beginning, either way, just glad you're watching with us today. Uh, just want to let you know a bit about what's going to happen for this afternoon, what we're going to do. Following this morning's teaching, Sam's going to come up in a little bit and he's going to, he's going to share with us from the Word. After that, uh, if you're part of our email list, you would have got a link with some songs and we would just encourage you to take time and to sing those songs out or to sit back and to reflect and to listen to those words, listen to the music. Then afterwards, we're going to come together and have a Zoom call where we're just going to talk about the message together, things that we God is teaching us, things that we're learning from that. And then we're going to have a time of communion together where we just get to break bread and just to reflect and remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. So that's This is something we do. We believe that, that Jesus has called us to do this. We know that and that's why we do it. So we would encourage you guys to participate in those things. So that's kind of the flow of how things are going to happen this morning. And just know that through this time, we, we continue to declare that, that God is sovereign. You know, circumstances like this that, that are unforeseen, things like that that happen, aren't a surprise to him. And even through it all, circumstances don't dictate how good God, God is. And it's up to us to continue to rest in that, just to rest and know that, that he's in control. When everything else around us may seem like it's out of control, we rest in the fact that God is in control. Our Heavenly Father is in control of this. And that, to me, that just brings a sense of peace. When I feel like, like things are, are stressful or I feel myself worry just building up, I can just rest and know that God is sovereign and I can just put my hope in that. And like that's the anchor that we need. And that's the anchor we've been hearing about in this message in Hebrews. And I, what hope that we have because of that. You know, Grace, and we talked about this lots, but we, we don't want to um, get over this. This is our mission. Our mission really uh, is, is to love Jesus, to love people and to help people love Jesus. We say this all the time, but we don't want to forget it. We want you guys to know that. When you talk to people, to know that that is our heart. That is behind everything that we do. We just want to grow in our love for him. And if you don't yet know Jesus, our heart for you is that you would know him, that you would come to know and love Jesus. And if you know him already, we want you to love him more, to grow in that love for him. You know, we can't physically gather. We know that, but we are just grateful for technology for this time where we can still gather virtually like this and just be engaged and grow in our love for him. And along with that, we want you guys to continue to reach out to each other, to love each other in the church. Send a text message, give a phone call, uh, tell them you're praying for them. Just love on each other this way. Let's continue to, to be the church and to, and to do those kind of things. We can't physically gather, so let's encourage each other that way. Sam's going to come, come up right away. We're going to finish off Hebrews chapter 9. There's the last half of that, and we're going to, he's going to lead us through that. But what, what hope we have, we can see in there, this Jesus who came as this ultimate sacrifice for that. And so I want to pray for Sam. I want to pray for my brother. And then he's going to come up, and then I'll, I'll come up afterwards, uh, and we'll, we'll go into the rest of the time. So will you just pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this time. We're thankful for the word, for, for your word, this truth that we have that we can anchor ourselves into. And I just pray for Sam. God, would you just open up our hearts and our ears and our minds just to have these truths permeate us that you have for us. The, the, the truths that Sam's been working on and preparing would just be this, these words of, of, of truth that speak to us. So would you just teach us this time, help us just to grow in our love for you now. Amen. Reading from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 28. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. 
Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sam Whitehawk. I'm a pastor with Grace Evergreen. Uh, I'm excited to be able to preach the gospel to you from the book of Hebrews today. Uh, so the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews. It's in the New Testament near the back. We're going to be in chapter 9, starting at verse 15 today. And so if you're joining us for the first time, um, we're in Hebrews right now at a major section. It's, it's actually a major turning point in human history. You see, the Bible's broken down into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Greek word for testament um, is, is the same word for covenant. And it could easily read the Old Covenant in the New Covenant scriptures. The Bible has one consistent message, and it's Jesus Christ. The Old Testament points forward to what Christ would come to do to take away sin by his death. And the New Testament looks back at Christ who died and rose again. And so like the formation of the Bible, these two defining covenants that God made with his people are a major discussion in our book so let's recap. We're in the second half of Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go back to the beginning of chapter 9. It goes into great detail about the first covenant, which is the old covenant. And so we looked at the, the tent, which is the earthly sanctuary, where priests would go in to offer sacrifices for sin. There are two sections to this tent. The first is the holy place, and the second is the most holy place. Now, only the high priest could go into the most holy place and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the thing about the, uh, the Old Covenant system is that the sacrifices for sins were continual because the blood of animals couldn't tru truly atone for sin and you couldn't receive ultimate eternal forgiveness. So it was all meant to be temporary. It was all meant to point us forward to a better covenant with better promises in Jesus Christ. We're meant to look forward. Jesus is a better high priest, and that's a representative. He's a better high priest who would offer a better sacrifice of himself. And in doing so, he secures for us an eternal redemption once and for all. So Hebrews 9.11 says, When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of blood and goats uh, and calves, but by means of blood, his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. That phrase, eternal redemption, is important for us, and it's such good news. To redeem is to buy back and deliver from slavery. Jesus secured for us redemption uh, or freedom from a guilty, sin-stained conscience. And he provides for us a purified conscience, trusting God when he says, I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And so redemption and eternal redemption is such good news in the new covenant. And so for ease and simplicity, I'd like you to consider the two parts of Hebrews chapter 9 in this way. Mercy and grace. They're two sides of the same gospel coin. Mercy, overly simplified, is not getting what you deserve. 
The Bible says in Ezekiel 18.4, the soul who sins must die. It's because of God's holy presence, his standard of, of perfection. The soul who sins must die. So when God, through Christ in the new covenant, says he'll remember our sins no more, that is mercy. It's where we don't get what we deserved, the penalty for our sin. Grace, on the other hand, is when we get something we don't deserve. It's unmerited, unearned kindness or favor. And so today's message is going to focus a little more on the grace side of things, in the inheritance of Christ received by faith. But mercy and grace go together. Uh, An illustration for you, one of the easiest ways to think about this is using debt. We have all had or currently have debt. And so imagine for a second, you owe a trillion dollars in debt. You will never in this lifetime be able to pay that debt back. In the ancient times, one of the options that you could do if you owe debt um, is either you'd be imprisoned or you'd become a slave to try and work off that debt. And with a trillion dollars in debt, you'd never be able to pay that back. And so to receive mercy for this kind of debt is to have someone pay off your debt and to completely dismiss it, to forget it, to remember that debt no more. So to have your debt forgiven in that way is mercy, and you're brought back to zero dollars without having the consequences of the penalty that debt incurred. But grace, on the other hand, is simply taking it even further to go from a trillion dollars in debt to now having a trillion dollars in your bank account where you get something you don't deserve. The mercy was having that debt forgiven and the grace is receiving all of that. And so that's a picture of the gospel. Because of the mercy and grace of God in Jesus Christ, we who owed an infinite debt penalty for sin, we have been mercifully forgiven. Our sins, the new covenant says, are remembered no more. But instead of just leaving us at zero and and sending us on our way, saying, you know, I hope to never see you again. In Christ, God gives us mercy and grace. Christ, who is sinless, he takes our full penalty for sin. And he dies under the wrath of God that, that you and I deserved. And in his grace, he gives us a relationship with the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything that Christ deserves, we now share in his inheritance. And so that's the good news of Hebrews chapter 9. So let's, let's pray as we start. Uh, Father, I thank you for this opportunity to, to preach your word, to get into Hebrews 9. And I just pray that you would use me in my weakness to bring clarity. Would you speak through me by your Holy Spirit? And I just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. And so let's start with our first passage today in Hebrews 9, verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So did you notice that phrase, eternal inheritance? And this is what I'm referring to when I speak about grace. It's not enough that God forgets our sins or offers us an eternal redemption, as we read about earlier in Hebrews chapter 9. God welcomes us in as believers and family. He adopts us as children, and we are then set to receive an eternal inheritance. And did you see that? It says, those who are called... Now, the the word called is is, is a loaded word, but it's referring to those that God has chosen, those that God has predestined, those that God has um, called will be the ones who believe and receive this eternal inheritance. And we're going to talk about that more as we get to the last verse of our passage. But those who are called receive an eternal inheritance. Now, there's a sense the entire Bible throws out a general call to all people. All people everywhere are commanded to repent, it says in Acts chapter 17. If you're hearing this message, we want you to believe in Jesus, to follow him, and to receive this blessing that he has offered today. But it says those who are called receive this eternal 
inheritance. And that's why in uh, Hebrews 8, verse 6, it says, As it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. This combination of mercy and grace, of eternal redemption and eternal inheritance, could not be offered in the, new, in the old covenant, but in the new covenant with better promises. In Christ, we can have those things. And that word eternal, that means forever. It's not going to end. It's not partial. It's forever. And Jesus does all of this as the mediator of a new covenant. Mediator is, is like someone who reconciles. And this is why his covenant is better. And the word mediator has profound meaning. Because Jesus brings in a new covenant with better promises. Because he reconciles God and man. An impossible task, but possible only in Jesus, who is both God and man. Because of the holiness of God, which means sinless perfection and set apart. Because God is holy, there is an infinite gap between God and man. So, Jesus comes to earth. He becomes fully human, fully God, and he stands in the gap as a mediator of the new covenant. And this is all possible, it says in verse 15, because Christ died. A death has occurred that redeems him from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The inheritance is only possible because redemption happened. Redemption and then inheritance. Mercy and then grace. Death and then a new covenant. The Apostle Paul, um, he wrote the book of Galatians, and he says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that's you and I, anyone who's not Jewish. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So I want you to cling to that. Jesus became a curse for us. You see, God didn't just dismiss the first covenant and the old covenant and say, it wasn't working, let's go to plan B. But God in Christ fulfilled the old covenant. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice and our perfect high priest because he obeyed all of the old covenant perfectly. And so he fulfills the blessing um, the, the obedience, and he receives all the blessings that, that no one else could ever earn. But the other side of that is Jesus becomes a curse for us. He redeem, redeems us from the transgressions of the law because he became a curse for us, because he took on our sin, because Jesus died under the full wrath and penalty that the old covenant uh, brought upon you. God simply said, if you obey, you'll be blessed if you disobey, you will be cursed. Christ became a curse for us. And that is such good news. He fulfills the old covenant perfectly. And then he brings in a new covenant. That's why he's a better mediator. So again, mercy and then grace. Redemption and then inheritance. All of this because Christ died for sin. And that's why he can reconcile God to man. So just an illustration to, to help you understand this, the holiness of God and who he is in his perfection. The reason why there's an infinite gap. The reason why there is no amount of time and no amount of good works that can ever bridge that gap between humans and God. Because God is holy. He is infinitely holy and perfect. And he demands perfection as we've read before. And so God is over here. And as humans, we are sinful. We're sinful beyond what we know. And the Bible says that we have been born into sin and we are constantly sinning. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then Jesus stands in the gap in the middle between God and man with outstretched arms. He dies on the cross under the full wrath of God, the full penalty for our sin that we deserved. And this is why he can mediate a new covenant. This is why he can reconcile God and man. Because Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, died in our place. And the gospel says, 
because he lived the perfect life that we could never live. And he died the death that we should have died. We have been brought in together, God and man. And it is such good news that Jesus did this for us. This is why he's a mediator of a new covenant, a better covenant with better promises. And so what we're going to look at a little more is, is how does Jesus secure this inheritance? And just like we talked about, it's because of his death. So in our passage in verse 16, it says, For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes place, or takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. And so the same word for covenant is actually the same word here used for will. It's used twice for will. And, but they're used in two slightly different ways. Of the 33 times in the Greek that this word is used in the New Testament, 31 times it's translated as covenant and two times as will. So in our passage, reason being the author is saying that the new covenant is like a will because a death had to occur for blessings to be paid out. Until that time, it's just a promise. It's something to look forward to, but hasn't been attained yet as long as the one who makes the will is still alive. So verse 18, Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. And so when you hear blood, I want you to think death for, for this passage. They're synonymous here. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats. So again, they died. Those animals were sacrificed on our behalf. He took the blood of calves and goats, uh, calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. And so what it's saying in the first covenant, Moses is the mediator of the first and old covenant. He would sacrifice animals, and it's their blood that was sprinkled all over the tent, the people, the places uh, of worship. So blood was so significant in the first covenant. And so the author is doing what he's been doing throughout Hebrews is he's going to compare and contrast again. The old covenant versus the new covenant. The first and the second. So he's saying Moses, as, as he's sprinkling the blood of calves and goats all over um, all the vessels used for worship, it's signifying something. Blood is so important and it symbolizes life and death. Murray, he's the uh, pastor of our downtown church. He summed it up like this. Blood in is good. Blood out is bad. Bl blood in signifies there's life, but blood out, outside of a person, signifies death. And in order for the first covenant to be inaugurated uh, or started, a death had to occur. However, in the old covenant, it wasn't the death of Moses or the people. It was an animal substitute. A substitutionary death occurred and blood covered over the people in the places of worship. Consider this verse from Leviticus 17. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So atonement, again, that covering over of, of sins, is possible by the blood. In the first covenant, it was the blood of an animal. In the new covenant, we're going to see it's the blood of Jesus. Because in the old, in the first, it was only temporary atonement. It could never bring about an eternal redemption, an eternal forgiveness of sins, because the blood of animals could not do that. But the author continues in verse 22. He says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So the old covenant system, the first covenant, was a bloody animal sacrificial system that temporarily covered over or atoned for sins. But it could never fully take away sins. 
That's why we're going to read later on that even those who would believe were not saved because of sacrifices or the blood of animals or goats. They were saved by faith in God. They were ultimately redeemed by what Christ would do. But notice that second half of verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This was to picture and point us forward to the new covenant. Because with Jesus' blood shed, there is forgiveness of sins. There is an eternal redemption. So verse 23 becomes uh, a very important transition for us in our passage in the comparison between old and new. Verse 23, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You see, the old covenant needed to continually have the tent sprinkled with blood. The priest had to go into the tent once a year into the holy place and the most holy place and sprinkle blood over the, the items of worship. As, as we said, he'd go fearfully into the most holy place once a year to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And if that priest came back through the veil, then the people would know that God had accepted their sacrifice, that they were able to continue on for another year. But remember the weakness and uselessness of the first covenant. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't purify a conscience and couldn't take away sin. It could only cover over sin until the next year, until the next sin. It was temporary and it was continual. The blood of animals was good enough temporarily to be involved with the earthly tent. But the heavenly tent the presence of God required a better sacrifice. Verse 24, For Christ has entered in, not into the holy places made with hands, so he didn't go into the earthly tent or the temple at that time, because they're copies of the true things, but he goes into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. You see, the Old Covenant, it says it was a copy of the true things. Or elsewhere, it says it was a shadow of the true things. It was just to point us forward. If you look on the ground on a sunny day and you see, um, you know, my, my figure, my shadow on the ground, you know that's just, it's a shadow. It's not the real thing. It's not the substance of who I am. Or John MacArthur uses this illustration and I like it. He um, talks about a, a picture. And so if my wife, Allison, were to go away uh, on a trip or a vacation, um, you know, and, and I just, I had the picture of my wife. And I just think, how great is this? I, I got something to remember by. It's this picture. It's a shadow. It's a copy. But it's not the true form of the reality. And so when Allison comes home, there's no need for the picture. Because the substance is there. And that's what it's getting at. The old covenant, the law, the tent, it was all earthly. It was all meant to be a copy in a shadow to point us forward to Jesus Christ. And so he goes not into the earthly tent, but he goes into the heavenly tent, which is the reality or substance that these things were pointing towards. And I want you to notice something about verse 24. It says that Jesus goes into the heavenly tent, not made by with hands, but made by God. And he goes into the presence of God on our behalf. It says he doesn't take his, um, he doesn't take the blood of animals. He doesn't take the blood of bulls and goats. He goes with his own blood on our behalf. And this is amazing because you and I could never go into the holy presence of God on our own. But Jesus goes into the holy place on our behalf. Earlier, we read of a phrase, he goes as a forerunner. He's the first one, and he's the one that actually brings us into the holy presence of God, where we can be accepted, fully loved, fully known, and not destroyed. That's good news because of what Christ did. But just as the high priest, once a year, would come out of the most holy place, he would go beyond the veil, that would signify that the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement was acceptable to God for another year under the first covenant. But Jesus, it says, goes beyond the veil by his death. And God accepts us. 
He tears the veil from top to bottom, signaling the presence of God. There is now access for you and I in Jesus Christ. But he doesn't just do this every year. Look at verse 25. It says, Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly or annually, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. So we got that comparison again. In the, new, in the Old Covenant, the first one, the high priest would go once a year with an animal's blood, a substitute's blood. But it says Jesus goes into the high place with his own blood. If he were to do this repeatedly, annually, it says he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He does it once. It's one perfect sacrifice. And the other thing, the animals, um, you know, they didn't sign up to, to be slaughtered and to be sacrificed. But Jesus, it says, he goes and he offers himself. He goes voluntarily to the cross to die in our place to offer a sacrifice for us on our behalf. Oh, and that's just, that's such good news that Jesus would do that. That's such amazing love. And he does so putting away sin once and for all. That's amazing. Because of Christ's eternal redemption and an eternal inheritance now awaits the followers of Christ. But I love that God doesn't just ignore sin or he doesn't just sweep it under the rug. God is just and he is holy. And as it says, the soul who sins must die. So Jesus becomes that curse for us. Jesus takes on our sin. And as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake, God made him, that is Jesus, to be sin. God put our sin on Jesus. So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In that verse alone, there's mercy and there is grace. Jesus becomes sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. He takes what we deserve and he gives us all that Christ deserves. That is the gospel. It's eternal redemption and eternal inheritance in Jesus. And that's good news. So in closing, uh, where do we go from here? The original audience had an important decision to make. Were they going to follow Jesus and his superior new covenant to receive God's mercy and grace? Or were they going to turn back to an inferior old covenant where they had to continually work only to come up short and not be forgiven of their sin? This same dilemma uh, is, is present for you today if you're listening. Will you choose Christ? Will you follow after him? It says in verse 27, Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. All people are appointed to die. That's a result of the curse of sin. We all have a day that we're going to die. And after that comes judgment. Every single person. We talked about this at the end of Hebrews chapter 7. Every person will be judged after death. So that's why Jesus being your high priest is so important. Every person is appointed to die once and then an eternal judgment. There is no reincarnation. There is no second chance. There is no purgatory or middle ground where you can slowly improve and work your way in. There is only this life now. That's why Jesus says, Turn to him, follow him, repent, which means turn away from your sin and and turn to God. Follow him today. Because it is appointed for man to die once and then comes judgment. However, if you're in Christ, or if you put your faith in Christ, if you trust in him and you put your eternal life in his hands, he can save you today. He can save you to the uttermost, as we've read in the past. He can redeem sin and he can give you the promise of a better eternal life with him. That's why verse 28 is so hopeful. It says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That's good news. 
The promise of verse 27 is that there is judgment after death. That is a guarantee. But the promise of verse 28 is that Christ is coming back again. He is going to return. Jesus is coming again to bring judgment upon those who continue to rebel and sin against him. But he's also coming to save fully and completely those who are eagerly waiting for him. Those that love him. He's coming not to die for your sins again, but to save completely and fully. He's going to bring them into his kingdom with resurrected bodies to the new heavens and the new earth. And notice the attributes of those he saves. It's those who are eagerly waiting. This means that the Christian life is both a looking back to remember the death and resurrection of Christ, his redemption, but it's also looking forward in anticipation of receiving all of the promises of our inheritance. Yes, we've received many portions of our inheritance that we enjoy today. We read last week, we receive a purified conscience in Christ. The Bible says we receive the Holy Spirit. We have God. We have a relationship with him where we're fully loved, fully known, fully accepted. We have all that today if we are in Christ. But we're still waiting for that final day, that eternal inheritance. And ultimately, that's Jesus himself. That's the blessing of the new covenant, is that God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. We will get to have the relationship with the living God that we were created for, to be with him forever. And so going back to verse 15, where it talks about those who are called received the promised inheritance. So are you called? And one of the easiest ways to figure out is, are you eagerly waiting for Christ to return? And so one thing that I wanted to close with is uh, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians, to the Ephesian church. And I want you to listen, all the things that we've been talking about, we've been talking about mercy and grace, redemption and inheritance, all because of Christ, all because he died and rose again. And so in Ephesians 1, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So God gives us the Holy Spirit to to guarantee for us that he will bring us into his inheritance. I just love the way that it says that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee. And in chapter 2, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the love, the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And it says, by the riches of his grace, not of your own doing. It's not a result of works. It's not of something you've done or an animal sacrifice or some sort of religious ritual that you have done. But it's because of Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Just like an inheritance is a gift that you didn't deserve but you receive because of the death of someone else. The gospel is a beautiful, eternal inheritance that we receive because of the death of Jesus Christ in our place. And that's good news. Hey guys, I'm back. Uh, thank you so much, Sam, for that, that word, that, in, that encouragement, this incredible covenant that we can put our hope in that Jesus has brought in because of his sacrifice. Man, I... What, what hope that gives us. And so now if you want to, as soon as I'm done, you can just click on those links that you have uh, that were sent in the email and just sing those songs out or just reflect on those words and just let them permeate your hearts. Uh, and I said this before, but I'll say it again. The beauty of this, the beauty of, of worshiping this way is that we get reminded of these truths, whether we, we are sing them out or we're, we're listening to others sing them, sing them out. We just get reminded of these beautiful truths. So just reflect on those truths sing them out. And then at five o'clock, right around five o'clock, we'll come together uh, for a Zoom call and we'll connect together. We'll share with what, what, 
we're learning, what we learned from the message, then we'll break bread and have a communion time together. So that's kind of what we're going to do next. So click on those songs, spend time and just reflect and worship God through music. Uh, and just know, Sam and I, we love you guys. We're praying for you. Reach out to us if you needed anything. Uh, we want to know that we're, we're here for you and we are praying for you. So anyway, we'll see you guys in a few minutes. Take care, guys. See you later.